The Enclave as a faction play a fairly crucial role in almost every iteration of Fallout. While never being referenced or mentioned in the original Fallout, they serve as the big bads in Fallout 2, with the main quest leading the Chosen One to blowing up the presidential oil rig. In Fallout 3, they follow a near parallel path to that of Fallout 2, a growing faction in power, only to be stopped by a hero who sent them fleeing. In New Vegas, after many of the Enclave were either killed or assimilated into the NCR, their faction is only optionally brought back together for one last ride. Even in Fallout 4, well after the Brotherhood of Steel's success with routing the Enclave remnants from Adam's Air Force Base, the sole survivor is able to meet a former Enclave soldier. And in Fallout 76, their lust for revenge against China doomed Appalachia to a second apocalyptic event. Their recognition within the Fallout franchise is only trumped by the Brotherhood of Steel, and perhaps the NCR. Yet despite their infamy within the games, and continuous appearances, there are a few misconceptions floating around about who they are, what they believe, and what they seek to accomplish. So today may I present 5 common misconceptions about the Enclave. Misconception number 1. The Enclave were founded after the Great War. In truth, the group that eventually became the Enclave was operating well before the nukes dropped. For a fact, we know that the last president of the United States, who came into office after the former president was impeached in 2075 for jaywalking, was part of the shadow government that fled to control station Enclave before the Great War. This already indicates that, to some extent, the Enclave was working prior to the war, making them technically a pre-war faction. The organization was setting up several contingency plans for when inevitable nuclear destruction would come. Though non-canon, the Fallout Bible mentions that in March 2077, prior to the Great War, the President and Enclave retreated to remote sections around the globe and made contingency plans for continuing the war. The oil rig, Raven Rock, the White Spring Bunker, and the Kovac Muldoon platform were all prepared in advance for Enclave operations after the Great War. To add, we know that it was the Enclave who was working with vault -Tec during Project Safehouse. Dick Richardson in Fallout 2 makes it clear that the implementation of vault experiments was part of the Enclave's great plan, whatever that may be. The oil rig was set up with the technology to observe and issue commands to the system of vaults remotely. This was the case for Vault 8, when the Enclave issued an all clear for the vault's doors to open and its residents begin the construction of Vault City. While much of the Enclave's observable work did begin after the Great War, they were the ones behind the scenes pulling the strings in American politics before the war. Misconception number two, they were wiped out after the battle at Adams Air Force Base. This one may be the least common misconception, as in I do think quite a few people realize that the Enclave isn't entirely defeated, but I've seen this idea thrown around a few times, so it makes the list. The Brotherhood Enclave War came to an end during the third Fallout DLC. After the Lion's Pride, with help from the Lone Wanderer, pushed into the Enclave's final eastern base and blew up their mobile base crawler. And while the Brotherhood claimed a resounding victory, the Enclave isn't quite eliminated yet. For starters, if we move to the west coast, there are a handful of Enclave sympathizers and remnants that have tried to integrate themselves into the new California Republic. Doc Henry, Orion Marino, Judah Krieger, Cannibal Johnson, Daisy Whitman, and Arcade Gannon all have ties back to the Enclave eventually being able to reunite for one last mission. Now, yes, this is a well-known explanation for the Enclave not being eliminated, but there is more. One of EDE's audio logs is a recording from Dr. Whitley, an Enclave scientist stationed at Adams Air Force Base. Whitley oversaw the iBot DuraFrame project. After it was shut down by Colonel Autumn for progressing too slowly, Whitley sent out a prototype, which was EDE, to travel to the Enclave's western base, Camp Navarro. The message that he recorded for the iBot mentioned an Enclave outpost in Chicago, and that it was in Illinois that EDE received the bumper plate that's attached to his backside. So unless something unknown happened to the outpost after the destruction of Adams Air Force Base, it would seem that the Enclave has some sort of camp or base in Fallout's Midwest, its size and capabilities unknown. But again, that is still not all. After the fall of Raven Rock and Colonel Autumn's defeat at Project Purity, the Eastern Enclave was left without a leader, stuck in limbo. The big bad of the Broken Steel DLC when you take part in the battle at Adams Air Force Base is an elite military unit known as Squad Sigma. The squad kind of comes out of nowhere in terms of the story, and they're a fairly trivial battle, and the only actual lore that we know about them is from Fallout 3's game guide. Their game guide entry reads, Enclave Sigma. 
After the destruction of Ravenrock, the Enclave performed a mixture of tactical retreat and all-out flight, and their grip on the capital wasteland loosened severely. Now contending with malcontented soldiers, the remains of Enclave camps dotted throughout the wasteland with little or no contact or ongoing tactical orders, and a lack of new recruits, the Enclave may be a doomed force. However, a small influx of specially trained fighters is seeking to fill the gap left by the Brotherhood of Steel's advances. Posted to previously unknown and highly secretive locations outside of the Capital Wasteland, only the most veteran of Enclave forces trained in multiple forms of combat to earn the right to call themselves Sigma. These six-person squads feature a leader clad in Hellfire armor and carrying an incinerator, and each man in has seen numerous combat sorties and lived to tell about them. Sigma squads are posted around locations deemed by Enclave High Command as imperative to the salvation of the cause, so whenever you encounter Sigma squads, you know something vital to the Enclave is close by. So a few things immediately stick out to me. One, the Enclave has several unknown and highly secretive locations across the wasteland, and two, an Enclave High Command exists. And if the game guide isn't credible enough regarding the existence of an Enclave High Command, there are two holodisks east of the mobile base crawler that are artillery orders sent from Enclave High Command. Now, we don't really know the who's or where's of the Enclave High Command, but at the time of Fallout 3, the Western Enclave has been thoroughly dunked on, so the High Command isn't referring to Navarro, the Oil Rig, or Ravenrock, so it could be just about anywhere. Perhaps the White Spring Bunker is Enclave High Command, but Fallout 76's story isn't quite finished yet, so it's hard to speculate anything. But this all just means that the Enclave hasn't been quite eliminated yet. They're a faction that's been known to bide their time while slowly accumulating power and technology. After the Eastern Enclave fell, maybe High Command deemed it time to retreat back into the shadows that they do so love. Misconception number three, they only disliked mutants. Dislike may be too soft of a word for the Enclave's true feelings towards non-Enclave members of the Wasteland. The Enclave absolutely detested mutants. But not only mutants though. They essentially hated everyone who is deemed to be not an Enclave member. We see this through their Cadillac and brutal treatment of the Vault 13 dwellers during the Fallout 2 intro movie. Thomas Eckhart executed all non Enclave personnel who arrived at the White Spring Congressional Bunker, regardless of pre war rank and influence. This included members of Congress. Janice Kaplinsky was killed in cold blood by Colonel Autumn. To the Enclave, people who are not Enclave members are hardly people at all. And sometimes they don't even like their own people. Frank Horrigan, the man who was once President Dick Richardson's personal bodyguard, turned super mutant after being exposed to the forced evolutionary virus at the Mariposa military base. Frank was taken back to the oil rig where he was operated on for two years, before eventually becoming a cyborg super mutant monster. And while Frank still calls Wastelanders muties, he is considered a genetically engineered freak by his peers. The Enclave absolutely hated anyone that was atypical. Frank was merely a weapon to be used. In fact, if we exclude the Lone Wanderer and Pioneer, I believe that the faction only employed two non-Enclave Wastelanders in their entire history. Anna Holt, a scientist who worked on Project Purity, and Stiggs, an engineer who worked on the Heavy Incinerator. Their distaste for all Wasteland life, including those who, by all appearances, appear normal, leads me to question their true intentions. Misconception number four, they're trying to restore America to its glory days. Now this is a question for everyone back at home. What are America's glory days? With the way President Eden's radio speeches go, it seems like the Enclave just wanted to restore America to its pre-war state. They wish to see the return of pre-war American values. They want to rid the harsh wasteland of radiation and mutants, and bring back the civility of old. And I think most people can agree that that's a noble cause, but the way in which they go about doing this could hardly be considered noble. As far as I'm aware, it's twice now that the Enclave has attempted to weaponize the forced evolutionary virus as a means to kill off anyone who's not associated with the Enclave. The FEV Curling 13 was designed to rid the world of human-based mutants, regardless of how mutated someone was. Exposure to mild radiation was enough for the virus to kill you, as seen with the Arroyo villagers. Heck, even the Vault 13 subjects died within 14 hours of exposure to the virus and the Vault Dwellers must have been the least exposed out of anyone. The only real survivors of the Curling 13 would have been the Enclave, and President Eden also wished to contaminate Project Purity with a modified strain of FEV based on the Curling 13, ultimately trying to achieve the same goal as their western counterparts. 
The modified FEV, according to Eden, will eliminate anyone or anything that has been affected by mutation. And while he goes on to mention that you'll likely be immune due to your vault upbringing, he's wrong, as drinking 5 infected aqua puras will kill you, leading me to question if the modified FEV can kill just about anything that's been exposed to the wasteland. And I don't know about you, but committing genocide against a substantial part of the wasteland's population doesn't seem to be the right step forwards to getting back to America's glory days. Even if you don't consider wastelanders to be Americans, certainly the mass slaughter of people just trying to get by isn't the first step to take when trying to restore America. With that being said, one could easily argue that America was founded on the genocide of people who were deemed as lessers, so there's definitely some parallels there. The world has changed. The United States of America, as it was once known, is no more. These wastelanders, who have been doing their best to survive in the horrid landscape of post-nuclear America, certainly deserve the chance to continue living. And in the case that they do plan to restore pre-war American values, I just have one question about their logistics. How much longer, and how much more destruction is it going to take before their plan is fully realized? By the start of Fallout 3, it's already been 200 years since the destruction of pre-war America. For context, the US as we know today, in 2022, was founded 246 years ago, in 1776. So the wasteland and fallout has almost existed for the same amount of time as the US has existed in real life. Pre-war America is not returning, at least not in the way that the Enclave dreams of. Their end does not justify their means. Besides, the Enclave as it is, despite only touting a few thousand strong, are just as corrupt as their pre-war selves. Misconception number 5. The Enclave is a democracy. A democracy is a system of government where power is held by the citizens. In places like Canada and the United States, this power is usually represented by several elected representatives through a series of fair elections at multiple branches of the government. This is to ensure proper representation of the people's wishes and wants. Yet, despite the Enclave touting themselves as the continuation of American government, it seems that fair democratic elections weren't continued. Let me explain. We know of at least six-ish Enclave presidents. The last president of the United States got into office after the previous president was impeached. Now, what was he impeached for? Well, the Sierra Depot GNN transcript mentions that it was for jaywalking. Now, I don't mean to raise any conspiracies or anything, but I'd wager that jaywalking isn't a normal offense that warrants impeachment. This leads me to believe that the Enclave set it up in order to get their guy, which was the last POTUS, into a position of power. Then there's Richardson Sr., the father of Dick Richardson, who had served as president before Dick rose to power. Not much is known about Richardson Sr., as most of his information is from the Followed Bible, so canonicity is a bit of a question there. Then there was Dick Richardson, who rose to power as a congressman with the help of political influence from his father, before ultimately becoming the next president five years later, also with the help of his father's political influence as current president. If that's not some devious nepotism, I don't know what is. Then, some time later, President John Henry Eden rose to power with absolutely no democratic election being held. He just kind of takes on the role of president without question after not receiving contact from the oil rig. A conversation between Colonel Autumn and the Lone Wanderer reveals that Eden merely assumed control and had no right to rule. On the Appalachian side of things, Thomas Eckhart rose to power after manipulating the automated ballot boxes of Appalachia to make himself president. One of my favorite quotes actually comes from Thomas Eckhart. He goes, We require authority, and those soldiers and statesmen only recognize two great authorities, God and the President of the United States and I don't know of an automated system that we can use to make God, so the latter will have to do. It's just blatant admission of voting manipulation, and the last of the six presidents that we know of was Modus, who again, like Eden, assumed power after he had brutally and maliciously killed off the rest of the Enclave members in the White Spring Bunker. So while the Enclave might like to give off the perception of a fair and democratic rule, it's more of an autocracy, where a single entity is in charge of all decisions, and their rule is above the law. And that's all I have today for misconceptions about the Enclave. If you have any others, feel free to leave them in the comments. Let me know what else I should cover in these misconception videos, maybe one about ghouls or the NCR, or maybe even about pre-war America. Don't forget to like, sub, and comment. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers.
Arbitrary power is most easily established on the ruins of liberty, abused to licentiousness.